Hey guys, it's Mark from Ace Tutors, and in this video, I'm going to explain one sample z-test for means. Just like all of my other hypothesis test videos, I'm first going to go over what this type of test is, when you would use it, and then I'll walk through the process with an example. So let's jump right in. As a reminder, the goal of hypothesis testing is to make a certain conclusion about a large population by using data from a smaller sample. One sample z-tests are just one way to do that when you have a certain population and certain data. So when would you use a one sample z-test for means? Well, you would use this type of hypothesis test whenever three things are true. First, you need to have one single population you are pulling data from. Second, your data has to be in the form of a mean as opposed to a proportion or another measure. And third, the population standard deviation sigma has to be known. If these three things are true, then you would use the one sample z-test I'll go over in this video. If, however, only the first two things are true, but the population standard deviation is not known, then you would use a one sample t-test, but I'll cover that in the next video. Now to solve these types of problems, we're going to use the same process we follow for all hypothesis test problems, the five C's, which we first discussed in my video covering the general idea of hypothesis testing. We're going to first create our hypotheses for our particular problem, then we will check certain necessary conditions are true in order to use the one sample z-test method. Next, we will calculate our test statistic and p-value, compare these to our critical value and alpha value, and finally conclude based on our findings. All right, let's dive into each of these steps with our first example. Let's say that your favorite candy company claims that their chocolate bars have a mean weight of 200 grams and their population standard deviation is known to be 5 grams. But lately, you've noticed they've seemed a little lighter than usual. You decide to sneak into their factory and take a simple random sample of 35 candy bars before you're caught. When you weigh them, you determine that the mean weight of those bars is actually 198 grams. At a significance level of alpha equals 0.05, test the company's claim. Okay, first, following our five steps, we need to create our null and alternative hypotheses. As always, I like to start with our alternative hypothesis. Our alternative hypothesis, H sub A, is whatever we are testing about the population. This will come in one of three forms. It's either that the true mean of the population is less than some value in the problem, greater than that value, or just not equal to that value. For our problem, we are testing to see whether the true mean weight mu of chocolate bars produced by the candy company is actually less than 200 grams. Then our null hypothesis is always just the opposite of this, which makes our null hypothesis H sub O mu is greater than or equal to 200. All right, next, as always, let's start drawing a picture of the distribution matching our problem to help us visualize it. Since we're doing a z-test, we're going to use a normal distribution. So let's draw that. And then we want to draw our distribution assuming the proposed population mean for the problem is correct. The assumed mean, mu, is 200 grams. So we're going to center our distribution at this value. All right, with that added to our distribution, let's set that aside for now and we'll return to it later. Now that we have our hypotheses and drawing started, we next need to check our conditions. For one sample z-test for means, there are three different conditions that need to be satisfied in order for us to be able to use this test type. Essentially, we're trying to make sure that the data we collected is a good representation of the overall population. The first condition we need to meet is that the data we collect is from a simple random sample of the population to ensure we picked our data points randomly. The second is that the sample size n is greater than 30. I won't dive too deep into why this is necessary in this video, but as I discussed in our video on z versus t scores, as the sample size gets above 30, we can be pretty confident that our data actually follows a normal distribution. And lastly, the third condition we need to meet is that the sample is less than 10% of the entire population size. Again, I won't go into too much detail right now, but the reason we need this to be true is to be able to reasonably assume that our samples are independent from one another. I'll discuss the details of these conditions in a later video, 
but for an intro level stat course, it's generally only necessary to just make sure these three conditions are satisfied in order to continue with the problem. Going through these for our problem, the question states that you take a simple random sample, so that checks off the first condition. Next, the sample size is n equals 35, so that satisfies the second condition. And finally, let's assume the company makes well above 350 chocolate bars, so that the sample size is much less than 10% of the population size. Okay, now that our conditions are met, we can move on with the problem and calculate the test statistic and p-value for our sample. As a reminder, the test statistic is just the standardized value associated with our sample data, in our case, the sample mean. And the p-value represents the probability of getting the sample mean we got if the true population mean is indeed 200 grams. Since this is a one sample z test and we're using a normal distribution, our test statistic is a z statistic. The formula for z for one sample z test for means is z equals x bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by the square root of n, where x bar is our sample mean, mu is our assumed population mean, sigma is our population standard deviation, and n is our sample size. Once we have our z statistic, we can then find our p-value by using a calculator or the tables from class. Alright, now let's calculate these values for our problem. For our problem, we know that the mean from our sample is 198 grams. Our assumed population mean is 200 grams, the population standard deviation is 5 grams, and our sample size is 35. Plugging these into our formula, this means that our test statistic z is 198 minus 200 divided by 5 divided by the square root of 35. Plugging this into our calculator, we get that z equals about negative 2.37. Now that we have all of this calculated, let's add all of this to our distribution. As I mentioned, our normal distribution is centered at the assumed population mean of 200. However, when we collected data on our sample, we found that the sample mean weight of chocolate bars was 198 grams. Let's say that that's somewhere like here on the distribution. It is obviously less than our assumed population mean of 200, so that gives some evidence for our claim, but this could have also just happened by chance based on the chocolate bars we sampled. To know for sure, we need to calculate the probability of getting the sample data we got. To do this, we first standardized our data from mean weight of chocolate bars into z-scores. As a reminder, the normal distribution is always centered at a z-score of 0, so 200 would be converted to 0. And then the z-score for our sample mean, we found that to be negative 2.37. Next, to find the p-value or probability of getting this z-statistic, we can find the area in the distribution from this value to the tail corresponding to our alternative hypothesis. Since we're trying to test whether the true population proportion is actually less than 200 grams, we would shade the area to the left of our test statistic to find the probability of getting a sample mean of 198 grams or less just by chance if the true mean weight is actually 200 grams. Now let's use our tables from class to calculate the probability of getting z is less than negative 2.37. The table I'm using already gives the area to the left, so the p-value we find in the table under negative 2.37 will give the probability we're after directly. To find the p-value, we look in the row for negative 2.3, coming from the ones and tenths place of our z, and the 0 0.07 column coming from the hundredths decimal place of our z. This gives that the area to the left of a z of negative 2.37, aka our p-value, is 0 0.0089. Now that we have our test statistic and p-value, we can compare these to our critical value or alpha value. As a reminder from my previous video, to make this comparison, you can either compare your test statistic to your critical value or your p-value to your alpha value. Since we have our alpha value given in the problem and we just calculated our p-value, let's compare those two.
It works out the same no matter which way you do it, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, to compare our p and alpha values, we just need to determine which one is bigger or smaller. With a p-value of 0 0.0089 and an alpha value of 0 0.05, the p-value is less than the alpha value. Okay, great. Now that our comparison is done, we can move on to our last step, conclude. If you recall, there are only two conclusions you can make for hypothesis testing problems. You can either reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis, or you can fail to reject the null hypothesis. To know when to make each conclusion, I like to remember the saying, if p is low, reject ho. That means that if our p-value is low, aka lower than our alpha value, we should reject ho, the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than the alpha value, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. For our example, the p-value of 0 0.0089 was less than our alpha value of 0 0.05, so we would reject our null hypothesis. To put this in context of the problem, we could say at a 5% significance level, we reject the null hypothesis and have sufficient evidence to support the claim that the true mean weight of chocolate bars sold by the company is actually less than 200 grams. Okay. So that's how you do a one sample z-test for means. If any of those steps were confusing, don't worry. I'd encourage you to go back and watch each step and really internalize what we did for each of the five steps in our process. This is going to be really important as we're going to follow this five-step process for every single type of hypothesis test problem. First, we create our hypotheses, then we check conditions, then calculate our test statistic and p-value, then compare those values to our critical value or alpha value, and then finally conclude based on our findings. In future videos, I'll cover many more examples of this and other hypothesis test types. I hope you found this video helpful, and if you did, please hit that subscribe button to support us making more videos for you. If you didn't, please leave us a comment down below to let us know what we can do better. Thanks again for watching, and remember, you have big dreams, don't let a class get in the way.